and we're going to close all of that. And now pull up this screen. Should be coming up in a second. There we go. Okay, so hopefully this will be a somewhat like fun lecture. I, at least it'll be for me. I spent the whole weekend updating these materials because um, they're just um, crowdfunding. The, the project of over half the members in this class pretty much changes. It fundamentally changes the capital acquisition landscape. So I added a bunch of new stuff specifically about crowdfunding. Um, Okay. So um, I'm going to start with like the easiest stuff and work my way to the hardest stuff when it comes to like investor and resource acquisition. Um, in general, um, you know, most most any small business starts out financing most of what it's doing with the uh, credit card debt and lines of credit. You know, that's, that's the easiest thing to get access to. Um, and it's basically, basically uh, your access to that is largely dependent on your personal financial situation, your credit rating. Um, that's how I fan financed both my businesses was by running up credit cards. Uh, it's not necessarily very good for your, your, your personal financial position, but it's the easiest way to get capital going and it's the way a lot of uh, businesses fund at least part of what they do. Once you are up and running and you have some assets of some type um, and you have uh, financial statements and a business plan that you can present to the bank, uh, there's all kinds of different uh, bank debt and small business loans that are going to be a lot lower interest rate than your, um, your credit cards. Um, but in general, when you're starting out with a new small business, it's very hard to get a bank loan. Eric, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, you're, you basically, you can only get a bank loan if you already have enough money that you don't really need the bank loan. Um, and like, if you're gonna get it as a small business, A, you need to have some sort of assets that the bank can feel comfortable about, and you need to be able to present uh, a history or a track record of, of, of financial statements and, and your business plan at least, and then they still may not loan it to you uh, because it, in general it's just hard to get. So, um, but in general, this is not something for a brand new startup. It's, it's for once you're up and running. And then the first thing that I'm gonna go into in more depth is uh, uh, grants. Uh, honestly, uh, this is both initial and once you're up and running. Um, there's an amazing amount of money out there from Uncle Sugar, basically. Um, whether it's the federal government, the state government, local government, uh, philanthropic organizations, there is a lot of grant money out there. Derek is kind of familiar with this. With, like, in general, that's what you're tapping into with the donations you're 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 looking for from uh, Target and so forth. They have like charitable foundations that donate money to different causes. Um, there's a lot of grants out there, and I've given you guys a pretty good dose in here of how to find them, how to apply for them. So there's a lot of good grant money out there for small businesses of all different types. We'll get into the details of that a little bit later on. Um, <clears throat> I've updated the crowdfunding materials a lot, so I'm gonna go over that first, and then um, at the tail end, I will walk you guys through the grant, um, the grant 
website details a little bit more. Um, so, you know, for for those of you in here who aren't doing the crowdfunding project, plus uh, to reiterate and drill into the heads of the crowdfunding project teams again, uh, I think you should you should think of crowdfunding as a guerrilla marketing campaign where you're selling a mix of some of your normal products. It's just like marketing your products. It's really no different. It's just that you're offering them at sort of a promotional discount price, but you're in effect, you're giving away products and exchange your donations rather than selling the products. But it's very similar. You're doing a guerrilla marketing campaign. It's just there's a mix between the products you normally sell that are offered at special promotional deals and donations or sort of giving away knickknacks and freebie stuff in exchange for people donating. But what you're doing is basically managing a guerrilla marketing project in many, many ways. That's what crowdfunding is. Um, a couple of tips uh, here. You know, you really want to have your project plan in place um, and your fulfillment uh, options in place before the campaign starts. I mean, a lot of people say that you know you want to keep a campaign to 30 days rather than 60. But in any case, 30 or 60 days of campaign goes by really fast. And um, as you'll see in a couple of slides here, um, when you start looking at, I mean, if you're going to do outreach with blogs that are going to like plug your like product or service and send people there, like it takes a couple of weeks just to get the meeting with the blogger. Uh, then it may be another month and a half or two months until there's space uh, in the schedule and uh, like on the plans for the website to actually post things. Um, so you've got like three months of lead time there before the blog posting can go out, leading people to come and make more donations to your campaign. So if you don't know the, the deadlines and time frame and timing of how long is it going to take for each of the elements of your marketing plan to actually go through, um, you're going to end up like with the deadline of your campaign running out before you've been able to do the outreach and the waiting necessary for everybody to follow up. So you want to make sure you're really clear with the project plan and then uh, your fulfillment. Like it all depends on the details of the product you're offering, but um, you know, in the case of <clears throat> in the case of both the community garden. I mean, the community garden is basically offering. If I remember your reward, tell me again. Like the rewards, there's some stuff that's like, you know, thank you for playing certificate. But uh, in the higher levels, what were the what were the rewards again? Um, you can uh, get a brick and grave that's going to be placed in the ground. Um, you can get. You can name one of the planter boxes. Got it. Got it. Or the tree, one of the trees after you and the family. So in your guys' case, like. You know, you need to have you need to like you need to have confirmed when like when you're going to be able to break ground on various things. The fact that the bricks are available, who's going to do the engraving? Like, you know, like, yeah, I know, but I'm saying this is in your case you know, the fulfillment. In the case of Mad Ink, like they're going to be giving away a hell of a lot of T-shirts and stuff, and those T-shirts need to be ready. Um, if they're not sent out by Mad Inc., they need to have a vendor, which basically has a bunch of their inventory in stock that can send out the, the inventory. Um, whatever it is they offer as part of the rewards in their campaign, um, they need to be ready to, 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 to fulfill it. So don't, don't underestimate like being in a situation to follow through with whatever you promised in the campaign. Those are the two things. And then... Um, you want to try and get to like 20% of your funding goal just as soon as possible based just on people you already know. Like from what I've like just recently researched about crowdfunding campaigns, 20% of the goal is kind of a tipping point. If you, if you get up to 20%, then other people that uh, just found it on, on Kickstarter or read a blog posting about it, they start to get excited about donating if it's already past 20%. But the 20% figure, you basically need to like, you need to have like ringers 
in the audience. You need to know exactly who are you reaching out to, who are the champions going to be, who do you know you can get to donate, and how do those people add up to 20% of your goal. If you can't express how you're going to get to 20% based on people you already know about, um, then you're probably going to have a hard time getting to 100%. But once you cross that 20% threshold, it tends to enable uh, a snowball effect to a certain extent. So um, I've added some nice information sources here uh, about all things crowdfunding. So CrowdCrux is a website that does uh, webinars, blog postings all the time about how to, how to do a successful crowdfunding project, top 10 crowdfunding websites, like new top 10 tips. It's great, like, info source for all things about being successful with crowdfunding. Vendors that'll do the fulfillment, like, all kinds of stuff in there. And then uh, Entrepreneur Magazine also has a very extensive uh, section of their website dedicated to the crowdfunding. They got a lot of good tips and resources and suggestions in there. And then we've done um, two webinars, one on crowdfunding in general and one specifically on equity crowdfunding through our SPDC just in the last couple months. So Kelly's going to come in and talk live about that. We're going to talk with him tomorrow. But for everybody in this room, we've got some good thought leadership right in Kern County here. Uh, if you just go and take a look at the webinars. So uh, I've given you links to all three of those things there for more information about crowdfunding. Um, I've also listed, you know, Kickstarter is the one we've been talking about so far with both campaigns. Um, GoFundMe and Indiegogo are two other sites. Um, I know GoFundMe uh, does not have like a campaign limit. Um, Indiegogo I'm less familiar with, but they all, like, in addition to that, there's probably like 20, 40, 50 other crowdfunding sites out there. Um, these are just the top ones. But I actually like found a nice list of all the other crowdfunding sites, and I gave you guys a link to it. So in addition to the top three, each of which has a slightly different deal on how they work, um, you've got a list of all the other sites as well. And then equity crowdfunding, um, in, 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 rather than giving away your products and doing giveaways, this guerrilla marketing campaign, equity crowdfunding is truly offering people equity in your company um, in, in really tiny bits uh, organized through a website and a mass marketing campaign. So this is all brand new. It's just been approved by the SEC. Everybody is learning as we go along right now. Um, but here's three of many sites that are, uh, are like kind of leading the way with the, the new equity crowdfunding game. Uh, and then a bunch of others as well. So I've given you links to all of these different resources. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, I actually pulled up the Edible Garden campaign. For those of you who are not um, working on these projects, or have you guys put together your page yet or not? I forget. Okay, so this is what it'll look like eventually once you've like put together your crowdfunding campaign. So. It's going to be a page on Kickstarter that looks kind of like this. Um, you know, normally there's there's going to be a logo, there's some text description. Uh, you've got a chance to put more graphics in here. Things can link out of this page to you know additional information. But the format that you're going to be presenting the venture in, Matt Inc. in your guys' case, the the Edible Garden. But in general, for everybody in here, if you're doing a crowdfunding project. This is the platform. You've got a page on a website that scrolls up and down like this, where you can put a combination of text, um, graphics, and so forth. The graphics can link out to other places so people can see all your materials, but that's the space that you have to work in. And then on the right-hand side here, you've got um, a bunch of pledge levels that you can, um, you can donate to the project. So for example, Pledge five bucks, custom thank you card, and a huge shout out on our social media pages. So if you send us five bucks, we'll say thank you. That's it. Uh, if you give us ten bucks, um, we'll also throw in a brochure too, okay? 
And this campaign isn't live yet, so you can't click on these buttons. But once the campaign goes live, you would just kick up, click on this button, type in your Visa card number, donate whatever, and then um, depending on what it is, if you went up here to the higher levels, um, so brick with your name. So in this case, if you donated the 80 bucks, um, you'd probably land in a place that gives you the information to type in exactly how you want your name engraved, um, contact information in case there's questions, that kind of thing. Uh, you give your credit card information, you give 80 bucks, and eventually you get your name engraved on a brick. Uh, in that case, instead of the brick, you're pretty much going to be doing things like, you know, the beer goggles thing? Um, yeah. You know, give give 100 bucks uh, and get, like, uh, get a, a custom set of, of beer goggles plus, like, a listing on our, like, thank you wall, you know? And, you know, the goggles probably are normally sold for 30 bucks. I don't know what the price on those things was, but, like, a hundred bucks is much more than the normal price of those products. The difference is, like, the difference is funding for the business, right. you know? So you give away some of the product and maybe a thank you email or, or inscription on, like, the wall in the back of the, the place or whatever. Um, and you, the, the, the links along the side here are, are different levels of options. So you give 5,000 bucks, you get, like, you know, a one-year supply of whatever T-shirts you want, uh, and one free weekend visit at the B&B in uh, in Ransburg within the next 12 months, something like that. Uh, that's what it's going to look like. So, make sense, to everybody? Okay, cool. Um, next, going back to the PowerPoint here, um, I put together my first crack at. Uh, uh, project plan. I, I asked you guys as the next deliverable to send me a project plan, uh, but as an illustration for everybody in here, I wanted to give kind of an idea of what I had in mind. So, you know, the, the guerrilla marketing map that I went through a couple weeks ago when I talked about guerrilla marketing, uh, I think your crowdfunding campaign is basically um, cherry picking different elements of that guerrilla marketing campaign and rolling them out with the, the product being sold is the donations to the project rather than whatever, you know. If, if the Condors do a crowd, if, they, if the Condors do guerrilla marketing, they're just marketing going to Condors games, you know. The exact same thing, if you just replace tickets to Condors game with donations to Edible Garden Project, it's very similar to running a guerrilla marketing campaign. So. What I had in mind, and what I think is important for each, for any group, to, or any project in crowdfunding to be successful, um, you need so prepping the materials and doing initial outreach is just, and, and having your fulfillment set up is something that every project's going to need. They're going to need it right up front. Um, just as an example, um, you know the materials could take less than forty hours. Uh, the fulfillment could take less than 40, but if you're starting with a project that doesn't have a fulfillment solution already, you may need to devote you know, many hours to that before you've got it in place. And until someone has invested those 40 hours, the project can't start. You need to have that problem solved. Um, so you know, the total number of hours needed, the amount of elapsed time or lead time that you need, and when it has to be done by, I think are critical to have in here. And, you know, I was just, I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about, um, I actually used, um, I used the community garden as an example, but I actually was thinking conceptually more about the Mad Inc. project. But either way, like, I think both of those projects have a, have a they have some outreach on social media. Um, so... In my opinion, that's fine, but I think most crowdfunding projects are going to have outreach on LinkedIn, outreach on Facebook, they're going to have outreach via email or phone or face-to-face. -face. You may be going through Pinterest, you may be going through um, Snapchat, you may be going through Instagram or Twitter, that depends on 
with this community. But I think what your goal is, is you're trying to come up with a certain number of champions. I mean, you're reaching out to everybody you know, and everybody they know, and everybody they know, and you want, you know, if, if I just do the math here, I think you guys are looking for 20 grand. So if we come up with uh, 100 champions, basically, each of whom can be counted on to donate 100 bucks, it's not bad. I think finding 100 buck champions, um, 100 times 100, is already 10,000, right? Um, and if those champions are then responsible for going out and finding, you know, uh, five other people that will each donate 20 bucks a piece, you're up to your 20. You're, you're, you're up to your 20 grand already. Uh, but I think the key is whether you're meeting with them face to face or you're, going, you're, you're reaching out to them on, on Facebook and LinkedIn, whether you're sending emails, what your goal is in the word of mouth campaign is that we want, you know, 20, 10, 15, whatever people from our network that we know well who are going to be counted on, A, to donate like 100 bucks or 50 or 200, whatever it is, and then B, who are excited enough about the project that they're going to tell five other people, that they're going to tell 10 other people. Like, you know, the goal here is to find a certain number of champions. That donate themselves and that promote promote to other people, uh, and you know there's no. It may seem easy enough, but you know it, to actually reach out to a hundred people probably in order to find twenty that like have the budget space and the time to be able to devote to it. Like you know, you may have to sit down for an hour at a time on three or four different nights to send out all those emails or make the phone calls. Um, and until you're done with the elapsed time of like a week or a week and a half, because everybody else, in, everybody has day jobs. By the time you get done with that outreach, it may have been two weeks that, that went by. So once you've got those champions in place, then you're looking really good. But um, I wouldn't underestimate how long it takes to reach out to the champions. But your goal is to find champions and word of mouth. Um, I think you're like two things that I didn't talk about as much in here, but after I left you guys in Ramsburg, I came back here and I went to the Mini Maker Fair on campus and I met with, did I tell you this story? Did I tell you the other? Yeah, did I tell the other crowdfunding group? Did I tell you guys? Okay, so $130,000 for a damn drone? That's awesome. But one of the things that they were doing that I forgot about is they're going to meetup.com events like three, two, three, four times a week. And they're going to this meetup event uh, specifically looking to come out of there with one or two new people who are like, yeah, I love this thing. I'll donate 50 and I'm going to promote it to some other people. Similar to the word of mouth, but instead of reaching out to everybody you know on email or on the phone or on social media, you're going to these meetup events, meeting people face to face. And the goal is to walk out of that meeting with, you know, one or two new champions who believe in the product, can be counted on the donated on it, and can reach out to promote it to other people. Um, so, uh, fairs like uh, uh, the Mini Maker events, there's, there's little, like, meetings of one kind or another that are basically trade shows or fairs of one kind or another um, that you can also use for the same purpose, but um, I think most campaigns are going to have some level of like, basically, I think in, in, in order for the project to be successful, somebody from your team and somebody from the, uh, from the Man 8 team is going to need to, like, who is going to the meetup event on Thursday this week, you know? All of us, one of us has to be there, which one can go? And then next week and the next week. And sometimes that'll be Brad and his partner, but I mean, somebody on the team, whether it's you guys or Brad and, 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 and what's your name? Somebody's got to, Carol. Carol, has got to be at these events. And somebody's got to reach out and send these various emails, make phone calls to develop champions. And then I would also say that some combination of finding blog, finding bloggers who are going to say, hey, you know, this week on my 
like crowdfunding blog, I want to talk about Mad Inc. This is a great company. You should check it out. You know, it's it's the 21st century version of uh, of like free pr PR and instead of instead of su some radio DJ saying, you know, uh, I I love this new album. You know, this is my favorite new band. That I'm going to play it for you right now. You've got a blogger somewhere saying, I think this is an awesome new um, venture for the crowdfunding. You should check it out. That's your goal is to get three, four, or five blogs to mention the product, and then depending on the circulation of that blog. So you guys are going to be looking at the um, you know people people that are talking to the like tree hugging community in Kern County, basically. You know anybody that anybody that like visits websites like that regularly um, reads comments that are active in, in, in being in, in these discussions. I mean, there's LinkedIn groups that talk about like environmental issues in Kern County. But I think that group, if somebody on the LinkedIn blog about like fracking in Kern County were to say, hey, this isn't about fracking, but for all the bad things for the environment in Kern County, you want to know a good one, it's this. And their campaign's going on right now. I bet you could find somebody on that LinkedIn group that would say something good about the Edible Garden. And then because of that, because the group has like 2,000 members, you can expect that at least a couple dozen are going to end up visiting the site because it was mentioned on that. So like, Mad Inc. is going to be totally different. You're going to be talking about like websites uh, and, and websites and things for the off-road community or things for the tourist community that are, you know, that are coming to... Um, Cool things that you, um, you know, cool things that you would want to see if you want to create your own custom like visit to California if you're coming over from wherever. Um, it might be more tourist oriented and uh, off road oriented communities rather than the. But I think what you're looking is is similar. But the, the champion as it is is not an individual person as much as it is a particular website. Or a particular like community that a lot of people in the off-road business uh, uh, the community are in, and somebody in that world says something promo-wise about the project and points people to the the Kickstarter site. Um, and then uh, Google between AdWords and search engine optimization, um, Google is the omnipresent platform that all search and information goes through on the internet these days. So. Um, even though I don't imagine either of these projects getting too many people from Google, you'd be surprised what, you'd be surprised who ends up clicking through um, AdWords advertisements and, um, and search results. I mean, honestly, many of the new resources in this presentation came up because I did a Google search and I was like, oh, hey, this is a good one for like future. I, I, I'm, I'm tired of the stuff that I've been presenting. So let me go find a new site that gives me a lot of good tips on how to do good searches. Or let me go find a, a, a website that I have I know has new webinars every week on crowdfunding. I, I just did a Google search, and whatever popped up in the first couple search results, I surfed through until I found some stuff that was good. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was somebody out there who were like originally excited about like excited about um, like they might have been searching for um, like environmentally friendly projects in Kern County so they just want to know better like what's going on in the area like uh, because they wanted to do a report about it for some other for their, for their organization or they're just into that kind of thing like I could imagine starting by doing a search just to find out what's going on. And if your project ended up coming up, like you found a person, you found a fellow traveler who's going to have passion about that topic um, because they were doing a search for something they're passionate about. But they, were, they had no intention of donating to a fundraising campaign, but they were interested in the general topic of the environmental health of this, uh, this neck of the woods, or in the case of Mad Inc., 
They're just interested in general about like off-roading stuff in California. They have no in interest in donating the project, but they're like, oh, hey, cool. Mad Ink? I didn't even realize they had all this stuff going on. I just saw that t-shirt one time and thought it was cool. I didn't realize it was this whole like venture going on. I think I'll donate to it. You know, they might have been searching at first for like new search results for um, for a good place to buy accessories for their uh, ATV, um, but the campaign came up, and because they care about off-road stuff, they're like, "Oh, cool! I think I'll donate." They never, they weren't looking to donate at first, but because of the topic and the way that the search results came back, you get some people that can't contribute there as well. But I think you need this whole plan. That's what I was looking to get from you guys and from the other two groups who are not doing crowdfunding projects right now. I think any time going forward, if you're going to do a crowdfunding project in a small business setting, you need this kind of a project plan to make sure that every make sure all your ducks are in a row before the campaign starts. Um, couple were any questions about that before I move on? Okay, um, traditional equity investors. Um, it used to be that I had no crowdfunding page in here, like. Crowdfunding is now because, like, I, in future classes, I'll probably do an entire session just on crowdfunding because it's part marketing, part uh, resource acquisition, part investment. It's it's a really interesting new area. But back before the days of crowdfunding, the the way that like you find equity investment is really through three types of resources. One is individuals. I mean, that's basically friends and family, um, I'd say, like, you need to target people who at least have um, 10K or above in just liquid liquid money that could be thrown out for anything, you know? If you've, you've got people who have enough, uh, have gotten to a place in their, like, saving and their earning that they've got at least 10,000 bucks that's not in any other mutual fund, it's not, like... Um, it's not tied up in another investment. It's just basically sitting in a money market fund, um, not earning a very good return. If you've got somebody that has 10 grand worth of cash that they can move easily, um, it's pretty easy to peel off a couple grand and invest in somebody's project. And that's how you get started with equity investors is friends, family, and, and associates that have at least 10 grand um, sitting around in their pocket. That they could they could part with, um, and obviously, the higher the higher the level of liquid cash that somebody has, the less painful it is to just pull off five or ten grand and say, "Hey, have fun," you know. Like, hopefully it works, but if it doesn't, it's not going to kill me. Here, here's here's ten grand. Um, name a brick after me, and and like, I'll come visit sometime. You know, the, the, the higher your personal level of income, the less painful it is to peel off a couple grand or up to 10 grand and just give it to a project. Um, so that's your first source of equity, um, is people you already know in some way, friends and family, but also um, also they have to have a certain amount of, of liquid liquid uh, capital available in their, their, their personal finances. And I think it should be somebody that gets some sort of interest or enjoyment out of the product. I mean, it's great. It's great. It's great that, like, if I think of my own family, like my uncle, my great uncle Marcus, I mean, my uncle, I'm sure my uncle Marcus could peel off five or 10 grand. He could have peeled that off any time he wanted for any of either of my two businesses. But he doesn't freaking believe in him. He never believed in him. He doesn't invest in anything other than like stuff he understands. So he's a poor target. He's got the money, but he's not going to invest in anything other than like certain types of investment funds that are very clearly labeled already. Or he might invest in um, he might invest in um, something that had to do with classical music because he loves the piano, you know. But other than that. It doesn't matter if he's my uncle. He doesn't believe in what I'm doing. Um, and even if he didn't believe in what I was doing, he might still be willing to th throw a couple grand at a classical music project because he's got a soft spot in his heart for classical music and he can't stand to 
he can't stand the fact that there's not enough lovers of classical music in the world. So I think in addition to being friends and family, there's got to be some kind of personal connection that people get, like, bless you. Um, the, there's got to be some kind of personal connection uh, where um, they they have a, a passion for that and an interest in it or, 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 or a soft spot in their heart for it. Otherwise, just because they're friends and family doesn't necessarily mean they're going to give you the money just because you're related to them or you know them. Um, partners and in in-kind resources. Um, honestly, I think a lot of businesses underestimate uh, a lot of small ventures in general, um, including stuff in large organizations, underestimate like how you could get either resources or capital um, from other businesses who have an interest in seeing you succeed. So um, I think to a certain extent, it's, it's a combination of like grant applications and, um, and in-kind resources, but theoretically, um, I mean, grocery chains in this, like I wouldn't be surprised if grocery chains in um, California like invested a certain amount of money or made a certain amount of like um, transportation and warehouse and so forth resources available to local farms because it's in their interest to have like close supply of, of, uh, of food. So like you guys are largely going through the, the, the foundations and charitable giving, but um, you know, it's honestly, it might be in the interest of like Kawasaki or whoever else makes like off-road vehicles. It might be in their interest to like provide you guys with like basically to provide uh, space Either land or or like uh, or, or building somewhere in like in and around Ranford, um, simply because and, and then then like they could they basically make the they could make the uh, the space available at zero rent, just make it available for free. Um, Mad Inc could be, do a few improvements to make it into B and B. Um, uh, space, and then basically that encourages more people to ride Kawasaki off-road vehicles. Um, but they're not donating any money per se, but they're giving you space for free because it's in their business interest. So I think there's a lot of ventures that um, don't, they underestimate um, how larger companies um, the Chevrons and large ag interests or aerospace interests here in Kern County that have a lot of money, how it might in one way or another be in their interest to see your venture succeed um, and make things easy for you by making resources available for free because they want to see you succeed. So that's a second type of equity. And then uh, venture capital and angel investors uh, is is third third source. and. In general, what I type here is, uh, you know, venture capital and angel investment almost never happens, especially for lifestyle businesses. So I think the chances of Mad Inc. ever getting venture capital or angel funding are, like, it's probably more likely that they'll win the Powerball <laughs> to fund their company than, uh, than get traditional venture capital. Just because it's, it's not the kind of business that works in that environment. Um, however, that being said, you can't win if you don't play, you know? So you might as, you might as well make sure that you're out there networking, make sure that the, the materials are out in the, the, make sure that you're presenting a professional face to the uh, venture capital world, because you never know. It, you, know, you can't win if you don't play, but you shouldn't expect that it's going to work out for almost all businesses. Like, Stampede, tech businesses tend to be like the, the darlings of venture capital. Um, bio, uh, uh, biotech as well, um, or like life sciences businesses. There's a couple areas that um, are the favorites of venture capital. Lots of other areas are not so much, but that being said, you wanna get your materials out there anyway. So um, moving on from that, um, I've got it like, I've got 
I don't really focus on business plan writing too much in this class. That's the focus of my entrepreneurship class, the 340, or in your guys, in your guys' situation, the future 640 uh, class that we don't offer right now, but I, I, I may do in the future. So um, we focus less on business plan writing in this class, but I think um, what you need for most what you need for most angel investors is basically a one-page executive summary of your business. Like, it's great that you have detailed financials. It's great that you have like a 20, 40, 60 page uh, summary and details of everything. But what you need is like everything that fits on one page so that in like, it's basically the extended version of an elevator pitch. So instead of 30 seconds to one minute, um, you've got one page and anything that's not visually on that page the investor doesn't have time to consider. So you have to be able to represent your entire uh, opportunity in one page. And then if people are interested in more, they click on a link here or they email you and you send them the whole 50 page document. But I think it's really important to have a one pager that visually can fit on one page, you know? Uh, or you know it might be it might be one page of a website, but basically, I mean visually, uh, like if it, if you can't get it to fit on one like eight and a half by eleven or one like like PowerPoint screen or computer screen size space, then it's probably too many moving parts for somebody to keep remembering at one time. So. Um, the extent to which you can represent it on one page, the better off you are in, in catching investors' attention and everything else will cascade uh, off of that um, if, if people want. It's not that you don't want to have the stuff available, but um, you, you don't ever want to send the entire detailed financials to start with because no one, everyone's eyes will glaze over after like the third line item. What they want to know is like, what's the ballpark uh, of the numbers? And are they real or not? What have you done to like check these things out? And then if I, if I believe that there's an opportunity, then I'll say, send me the whole financials. But very important to have a one pager summarizing the opportunity. Yes, Chad. Yeah, I, I mean, I go back and forth. I've, le I've given you guys an example on, uh, on Blackboard. So this executive summary sample right here is a format I've used in the past. Um, it's not foolproof. Uh, I think there's better ways to do it. Honestly, I think there's too many words and not enough graphics in this current format. Uh, but yeah, here's one example. It's not necessarily perfect. So would you recommend putting like images and graphics on a one-page business, like a one-page uh, executive summary? Well, like simply speaking, like if you think about like brochures and websites and so forth, rather than the word product, I'd probably like have a picture of a product <laughs> and then uh, like the picture is here and then the words are here describing it. And then there's another picture here of like the customer. Um, and visually it's not like, it's not so formatted like a page, you know, visually, it's easy, like, oh, picture, paragraph, picture, paragraph. So they create it. Doesn't, yeah, it doesn't look so painful to read as this one. Like, even though it's only one page, it's got no pictures anywhere, and, like, I know that I'm going to have to read a whole page. Like, with some, some visual organization a bit different, um, it seems less daunting. I think it's easier to catch people's attention. Make sense? Okay, no problem. Other questions before I move on from there? Okay, so going back to the slides. Um, you know, I've before I get to the information sources, which is the last thing I wanted to do today, I just wanted to talk briefly about two different concepts, like harvest options versus exit options. Um, you know, if I take... This is a little bit different for the condors because that's a, that's a going concern that's up and running already. But the other ventures in here, we don't know yet whether Brian's 
like the app is ever going to become something or not. We don't know whether Mad Inc. is going to grow beyond where they're at right now or not. Uh, and we don't know whether the community garden is going to become a legendary permanent part of the tourist map of this campus or whether it's going to get started and then kind of fizzle after a couple of years and we don't know. So um, in general, like other people have different definitions of these things, but I tend to think about most small businesses as like having harvest and exit options. Harvest options are harvest options are things that you continue to do yourself, and they tend to involve projects or products that nobody else cares about. Like if someone else is not interested in running it or being part of the team or being part of this exciting venture. If, it, even if you have a hard time getting people excited about something, it should, like, you don't want to keep having that problem if you want to have a successful venture. If you notice that you constantly have to try and make water flow uphill to make a project work, then it's probably not a large scale successful venture. It's called a hobby. And that's what it is. Honestly, I have a great, I have a, a, like my best friend from high school, not Todd, he's another friend from high school, but my best friend Matt, fellow band geek from back when I used to play saxophone, he played bass. Um, Matt has an ATM uh, cleaning company. Uh, and he still does it to this day. He earns maybe 10 to 20 extra grand per year um, that helps he and his wife like pay for certain things around the house. They make a small profit on it. Um, he went bankrupt, like trying to make that work as his full-time job, but he loves doing it, and he's got a couple people that like still pay him, so it's a hobby. It makes some extra money on the side, but nobody was interested in like a large-scale ATM services company, just not there. So, um, if you notice that there's something that other people get excited about, that other people are interested in running and managing, those are exit options, and you usually end up selling those. Uh, for equity uh, in one way or another. So uh, I think there's a difference between harvest and, uh, harvest and exit. Any small business project that you're doing is at least valuable to you, if nothing else, because you care about it and you're doing it. The number of other people who you can easily get excited about the venture tells you whether the long-term fate of this venture is as a hobby or whether uh, it's actually going to stick around and outlive you as, a, as an institution and as a venture. So uh, there's nothing wrong with harvesting and having hobbies. Um, they make you a little extra money, you have fun with them, but I think it's important to understand that any, any venture eventually needs to land in one of those two categories, and don't be confused about which category you're in. If you think you're a big venture uh, and you're really just a hobby, it's a great way to go bankrupt and a great way to waste large amounts of time and energy in your life. If you think you're a hobby and you're really a, a, a major venture, um, you're probably missing out on opportunities and like managing the, the, the opportunity unprofessionally. So depending on which bucket you're in, um, I think it's important to understand whether the dog is going to hunt or not and with what level. Trigger, yes. Um, cr crickets chirping? <laughs> no, I'm sure I could come up with some. I don't have any right now. I just, it's more of a gut feeling. Um, but, you know, if I, like, if I have to explain something, like, to every, like, second or third person that I talk with, and then they still have this, like, distant look in their eyes when I'm done explaining the concept, I mean, they ain't gonna work, you know. Um, and if if I like honestly, um, like this whole crowdfunding thing, like it's it's blowing up it's, without me having to do anything, you know. Like you guys want to do this project, like Evelyn uh, from the dean's office from from the president's office noticed that like somebody was talking about it, and now we're having another meeting. Matt Inc. wants to do it, like. I'm just sort of directing traffic as we, we deal with these opportunities and trying to make things professional so that we can be reasonably certain of success. Like, this is a, this is a tiger, you know? Like, I, 
I keep finding people that are interested in this without me having to convince them, you know? Um, I'm still to this day trying to explain to people what my music licensing company did and why it's so cool, you know? It's one of the reasons why I'm not doing that anymore. I love my music licensing company, but I, I have to explain to them what the hell I do every time. It's probably not going to work. And nobody's like calling me on the phone like, God, I wish I could find somebody that would license music. No, I'm always going to them and like pushing it, you know? So that's, that's my big, big comment there. Um, it's 9 o'clock, so I'll go a little bit more quickly here. Um, information sources on this page um, is what it is. The, what I wanted to point your attention to was two things. on uh, One thing on the grants page, one thing on the investors page. So on the grants page, you know, I am just blown away by how many grants there are out there. Um, it's basically free money. You know, you just have to fill out a bunch of paperwork, but you can get money for almost anything um, for free from the government. So this grants.gov uh, is federal government grants, all different types. So um, if we go in and look at um, browse categories, and then you know, you've got agriculture, business and commerce, information and statistics, if we just click on business and commerce, and then this very first one here, state trade and export promotion. No, excuse me. I think this this third one here is the one that I was interested in. The like U.S. Mission Brazil thing. Um, if you notice here, basically. Uh, they give you a, des a description of exactly what kind of projects you can do for this, um, what kind of, uh, of, a, of an uh, organization you have to be. Long story short, like, if you can think of something that's going to promote, like, Brazilian commerce in Kern County, like, you can get between five and ten grand for free from the government just because you're promoting commerce with Brazil. So, you know, in my case, this, this is a little bit out of left field for you guys, but if you know anything about people from Brazil, like they have very similar, like, business interests, exports and stuff as we do. So any kind of networking events, um, you know, trade fairs, any kind of thing like that around here, um, theoretically, if you phrased it the right way and you, you focused on the tourist angle, you might be able to get five or ten grand for the Mad Ink project because somehow it's encouraging Brazilian tourists to, you know, come to come to the desert in the future. Um, and this is hundreds and hundreds of opportunities here. I know we're past nine o'clock, so just to say really quickly, um, you know, almost any of these um, you know, I clicked on one in agriculture that basically had um, 10 to 20 grand available for any small business that's going to promote the business development skills of agricultural businesses in California. Yeah, that's us. Uh, that, 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 there's too many for me to forward. Like, they're all in here, um, organized by. Um, so basically, this is the type of funding is from not so interesting. Sometimes there's certain criteria, so you may have to be um, a, a county government or a city government, but you can do this in cooperation with the university or do it in cooperation with somebody. I mean, technically, um, this university is an agency of state government in California. Like, how exactly we do the paperwork and how it gets funneled is different, but. You've got it organized by type of, uh, of business, um, type of, 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 of venture. There's a lot of grant money out there. Um, I, I'm quite blown away by it. And then the other thing I wanted to point out, and I'll let you guys go, um, is the, uh, the investor sources. So in addition to, in addition to that grants, I've also given you uh, there's some great information on the Small Business Associate, uh, Administration's website about grants. Um, this 
California.gov forward slash grants is exactly the same as the federal one, except this is money from the state of California. So right now there's a lot of stuff in there about Prop 1 and uh, you know renewable water solutions, but um, there's all kinds of California state money uh, organized the same way as the federal one. And this one, and then uh, this is another good information site, and then this grant watch here, this is not just federal, and, and this is not just government money, but money from foundations, money from um, not-for-profits, money from uh, non-governmental organizations like the UN and stuff, um, or Doctors Without Borders. Um, uh, organizations like that. So there's a whole bunch of, of non-governmental donation money at that website too. And then finally, um, Tech Coast Angels, I wanted to point you to as uh, um, a useful useful final resource here for the day. Um, they have a real nice organization here of the type of ventures that they're looking for and the criteria. So when I talk about the, the Tech Coast Angels is basically a group of angel investors from Southern California, largely on the west side of LA. Um, and as the name implies, they tend to invest in a lot of technology companies, but not just technology companies. Um, and they, you know, they, they, they got several million, uh, depending on what the venture is, and they can fund it like that if they believe in it. So there's a great description here of, if you go to the entrepreneurs section, there's a great description of exactly what kind of ventures they're looking for. Um, exactly like the the issues so strong management team technology that solves pressing needs in some way dominance of a niche they describe exactly what they're looking for and this is a great description of how you want if your if your venture uh, your small business in some way um, can fulfill these criteria um, or you can pitch it or like mold the way you describe it in a way that um, that fits these criteria. Uh, it's not just for Tech Coast Angels. This is what most annual investors are looking for in one way or another. So the entrepreneurs section of that website is a great way to get an idea of how you need to present things to be successful to um, equity investors like angels and venture capital firms. And then in addition to that site, there's also uh, Angel Capital Association and FundingPost.com, uh, both of which are uh, basically clearing houses where you can find uh, their websites that will tell you all of the different Tech Coast Angels organizations all across the country. So Tech Coast Angels is just one group of angel investors in Southern California. There's hundreds of these groups all across the country, and those two websites are good um, to find all the rest of them. Tech Coast Angels is particularly well organized though in how it describes what they're looking for for ventures, so uh, that's a, a particularly good one to look at for, for information. Uh, it's a couple minutes past nine. Thank you guys for being patient. Uh, we will do a general information session on Wednesday and I may have a guest speaker. I gotta confirm with Kelly whether we can do it or not. So, so uh, I, uh, I owe Brian a contract. Um, I have a couple of things that I can write up already. I think I can write up what I can write up already. I need to go to the website. I talked to him on Friday. I think I called him. I called him and told him, like, don't forget, I have some input for you, but I can't get it done, like, on that Friday. So he knows. But uh, I told him I'd do it on the weekend, and I need to do my company or send it, like, by tomorrow. But basically, I don't know how you guys feel, but what I found is, uh, um, like, A, as soon as I opened the app, 
on the phone. The first thing you saw was right there. Yeah. There was no navigation on that. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I couldn't see anything that I could do with the workouts. I mean, I can start one, but otherwise I can't do anything with it. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Um, I feel like there has to be workouts set up for whatever day you um, you work on. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to create any workouts, but the workouts that like Justin and I think you were using the your on the website. Yeah, on the website. Yeah. Uh, anytime I clicked on, and I put this in my notes, but anytime I clicked on one of those dates, uh-huh. my app crashed. When you clicked on one oh, that you had you set up, <laughs> yeah, like one that you had set up in the <laughs> website? One, not that I set up because I can't set anything up on the website, yeah. or not that at least. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah. but there were, on the 26th, but there were a lot of uh, workouts for that day. And oh, yeah. I could figure it out and see if I'm not on it. I thought maybe I could access on those websites also on. So if you try to go to that day on the so basically, if you try and put on someplace where someone else created the workout, the crisis, the what's the here? that it's um, closing in on 5,000 steps and I haven't even, like, I didn't even go for a walk. <laughs> so anyway, point is, um, when I was playing with all the features on um, on my Fitbit and all the features on Map My Walk, which I always use, oh, I was, um, honestly, I think Brian needs to be taking a look at the format of these um, and, and the, the, the way that the, the, way that the, the, the user interface works. I mean, this looks, it looks amateur compared to, um, to like the way that the Fitbit and the, and the, there's simple functionality things that um, I think no matter whether you're a hurdler or long distance or whether you're in some completely different sport, um, there's certain simple functionality things um, that um, Fitbit, Map My Walk, any of a number of other existing apps 
um, you should just mimic their personality, yeah. uh, not reinvent the wheel, you know? Huh? No, not yet, but I'm going to. That was my thought, though. What do you guys think? Yeah. Okay. Um, I haven't read any, like, update emails yet, so um, do you need any information? I'm eventually going to read everything. Uh, that was my, my, my observation from last time. Is, is that I think the information he gave me, he had some uh, app developers at work. So actually, because I don't run apps to that degree, they asked me what they have kids. But so I don't feel like I can tell them what he told me, but mm-hmm. they don't tell me what that means. Well, no. So, Tracy, <laughs> gut feeling. Um, do you think the situation is about what I. What I predicted. Good. Good. My my gut feeling here um, is that Brian basically doesn't know what he's doing, and he's got people that are working very part time and yes, without true. without their whole whole heart. Yeah, he has it outsourced somewhere. And but, but and but, but they're doing a lot of other stuff too, and they may or may not give a damn about his ass. Right. Right. Am I getting? Yeah. Is that your gut feeling that you got as you talk to him? Yeah, after he okay. I think it's a decent idea, and Brian is an industrious guy. So, like, if after nothing I, else, go ahead. After I go back and uh, take this back, and let the expert experts look at it, I may give him some suggestions about what he wants to continue using that particular device. Yeah. Because if nothing else, he should know. I mean, he should have been able to ask those questions just because they should have given him that information. Mm-hmm. If I say, okay, so. So, um, but the, the cool thing is, if nothing else, like, um, you know, every, like, every third or fourth, like, new idea I hear from somebody is about a, 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 a software app of one kind or another. And most of them talk a lot and do nothing. So, just the fact that we're dealing with these problems um, is further along than a lot of people, um, even though... The problems have to be solved. So, if nothing else, if we just end up instructing Brian better on how to do his project more professionally in the future and deal with some of the technological issues that he doesn't understand, but we can help him to understand better, uh, that's still a success. And he's industrious enough; he'll move forward like slowly but surely in trying to, to deal with this. So, um, yeah, my initial, uh, my gut feeling was that he probably doesn't like. He doesn't know what the hell he's doing with, yeah. with, uh, with app development. And it looks like his developers are very part-time and don't really care. Yeah, yeah. and if he doesn't, and if, it's, and if that is actually the case, and he doesn't really know much about what's being done, he's going to have a hard time even getting these modifications yeah. made. Yeah, no, I see you, so. We have a hard time. We have our own team in the area, like, of it, to our company. Sure. We have one guy here that directs that team. So I, so I made an email on the and said, hey, what do you, what do you think of this? Let's yeah. try to get you this deeper. Ask him. Yeah. Seriously, yeah. Like, yeah. That, I told you last time, and I told him that I told you this. Yeah. Like, I want you to get in space. And like, yeah. like, like you know, I, mean, I think you need to deal with this, Brian, or how much are you getting taken for, man? Like, I think I actually could suggest somebody or resources where you yeah. get it done cheaper yeah. uh, and better. So I think he needs to hear these things. If he, he doesn't, like, if he disagrees, then cool. Then, like, he should speak up and explain what it is that we were misunderstanding. But I think, I think, he'll, I think he wants to hear these things because he doesn't know what he doesn't know. So I think uh, once I take it back tomorrow, I'll have a chat with you guys again. And see what they say. And I'm gonna, I think I'm going to be running the night. Just be a little nosy. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it can 
only do good by you by asking him every question you think is valuable to ask. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, yeah, I mean, honestly, um, I, I, if I had, like, if I weren't doing a lot of other things at the same time, I would have asked him a long time ago, dude, like, what, what are you blowing on this project? But, like, can you afford it? Like, A, like, do you have more to spend? And if so, can we do this more professionally? Or if you really can't afford what you're doing already, and, like, you just, you're passionate about the project, but really you're already at the, the, the limit of what, like, you're, like what you feel comfortable with spending from your like leader budget. Um, if you need less, then also let's get rid of this team and find you somebody closer to home who's interested in this project um, and willing to work for equity or something else. So rather than somebody offshore who's getting paid hourly for a half-assed job, um, we find somebody close. That we either find somebody that would pay more money to do it like more professionally and we care about it more, or we find somebody that does it for free who's actually has passion for the project. Or who wants to use it in their, you know, so if I'm trying to, so if I'm trying to learn how to write that kind of app and I have two people that already know the app, hey, we'll take it for half the cost. Yeah. And I'm going to learn how to write the app. Yeah, you still exactly. Well, the other people, exactly. Like, the other people and you actually get Which is actually answer. a real possibility. Yeah, no, I, I Ask him, yeah. like, I haven't, I haven't heard anything that I think you shouldn't talk to him about. Okay. All of the above. Yeah. Just find out what he says. Cool. All right. You guys good otherwise? Yep. Yeah. Okay. See you on Wednesday. Wednesday.